All right, and we are live with another Friday noon Pacific Standard Time book discussion. Today's book is the brand new one, Dare to Lead. Make sure we don't get the glare here. Dare to Lead by Brené Brown. Um, I have not read any of Brené's work before. She's a she's very popular um, on the uh, the lecture circuit. Has a huge company doing great work as far as empathy and empowerment for leaders and teams. So great work um, that she's doing here. Um, I uh, just got the book last week, um, spun through it, and I will give the review here in a second. But I did want to give a shout out next week. If you come into this a little bit late next week, we're going to be discussing Grit by Angela Duckworth. Um, so that'll be the book of next week. And hey, Fridays noon, you just know that I'm going to be here hitting the highlights of one of the books that I've read. So this is not necessarily meant to be a book summary. Certainly we'll summarize certain portions of it, but I spin through the book and I just kind of highlight sections, passages that jumped out at to me and had a practical application for frontline leaders out there. So I really consider this more of a book highlight section as opposed to a summary. I always encourage you to read the book mainly because you're going to get something different out of every single one of these books than I am. The experiences that you have had, the current environment that you are in are going to resonate with certain things that don't resonate with me. So always picking up the book is, is a good idea. Don't let these, uh, these little hour-long uh, highlight reels uh, dissuade you from getting the book because you're going to get something out of it. I also mentioned those highlights because I will be completely honest. This book didn't impact me as much as I was hoping it would. I won't say that I disliked reading the book, um, but it was pretty middle of the road for me. Just a lot of the things just didn't resonate with me or I took to be a given. It wasn't an area that was um, a weakness of mine or one that I hadn't considered or thought about in the past. So the other reason to highlight the books, and I really recommend taking a marker with you or a pen and simply underlining or highlighting certain portions is, when I went back through and reviewed my highlights, there was a ton of great stuff. So while I didn't necessarily enjoy the book, again, I didn't necessarily not like it as well. It was just kind of middle of the road. There was a lot of really good stuff that could be great takeaways for you and for leaders that are out there. So I encourage you to highlight the books that you, you read. That way it also makes it very easy to pick it up later on and spin right through it. I can spin through a 250 page book like this, review my highlights, usually in 15 or 20 minutes. And so you can get kind of that Cliff Notes version or Spark Notes as they're known now um, very quickly. So with all of that being said, let's dive in. And I'd like to kind of introduce the book um, with the first two paragraphs of the, uh, the front cover um, here. And that is, leadership is not about titles, status, and wielding power. A leader is anyone who takes responsibility for recognizing the potential in people and ideas and has the courage to develop that potential. That comes up later on. It's a fantastic um, way of describing leadership. We'll come back to that in the book. When we dare to lead, we don't pretend to have the right answers. We stay curious and ask the right questions. We don't see power as finite and hoard it. We know that power becomes infinite when we share it with others. We don't avoid difficult conversations and situations. We lean into vulnerability when it's necessary to do good work. And just a fantastic little start um, to the booking and a, a kind of little glossing over, I want to say summary of what's going to be talked about um, throughout the book. Brene Brown, for those that don't know, is a licensed clinical or medical social worker and a PhD. She's a researcher um, out there and has worked for a couple of decades on the topics of vulnerability, shame, emotional intelligence, empathy, those sorts of things. So it's a very soft-skilled approach to leadership, which I'm a big fan of. I like that transparency um, as much as possible in your leadership. I think you get a lot out of that. And so I was very interested to get into this book and get some of her thoughts on that. And so a lot of this talk is going to be touchy-feely, but it is important in today's day and age especially, where we have access to as much information as we want, where we crave authenticity with peop from people as much as possible, it's important to be that open book for everybody out there, not to use the pun here. Um, you are left. Hey, Julie, good to see you here. I'm glad we could hook up on, on your day off. Christina, great to see you here. David over on YouTube. It's going well for me. Um, <laughs> if you want to see them again, bring them back. Nice. Funny, Jave. Um, so 
starting off here with just my highlights. And again, as I go through this book, it's not necessarily a summary per se. It's just pulling out some of the highlights, talking about some of the topics. Hopefully it inspires you with some of the wisdom from the book, but also inspires you to do a little bit of a deeper dive into it as well. Um, one of those talks, and again, lots of, she's she is a researcher on emotions for all practical purposes. And so she applies it to leadership principles, which I think is absolutely appropriate. But so there's a lot of emotional ties in here. And that is, Courage and fear are not mutually exclusive. Most of us feel brave and afraid at the exact same time. So a lot of the daring to lead aspect, the, 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 the purpose of the title here is that you have to have the courage to open up and be vulnerable with your teams as a leader, to admit your mistakes, to have the difficult conversations. And so the, the, the aspect of courage is that you balance that against fear. And a lot of times we feel like we don't have any courage if we still have fear. And that's absolutely not the case. Everybody has fear, constantly has fear. The question is, is what they do with it. Do they let that stop them or inhibit their performance? Or do they set it aside and have the courage to move forward? So realizing that just because you're afraid to have that uncomfortable conversation with an employee doesn't mean that you're lacking in courage at all. The test of that courage is whether you have that conversation. Um, the other aspect of courage, so opening up this topic about um, a daring to have the difficult conversations, daring to expose yourself to your um, your team members so that you can create more trust in that environment. And that is that courage is contagious. Just a really quick takeaway um, there that when you are courageous, when you are willing to be authentic with your team, then the team is more ready to reciprocate that in how they behave towards you. So if you want more from somebody, oftentimes you have to lead into that. You get what you give, and that goes for courage just as well. Um, carrying on with that courage discussion, if we are brave enough often enough, we will fall. Daring is not saying I'm willing to risk failure. Daring is saying I know I will eventually fail, and I'm still all in. It's the recognition that you are going to mess up. And it's an important aspect in things. When you know, doing live sessions and we're talking through difficult conversations, interpersonal com um, conflict and managing that, and I talk through a method of doing that, but it takes practice. You know, mediating conflict between two individuals isn't something that you're just instantly good at. And so it takes practice. And so, so many of these things, you might try to be authentic with your staff, but you're going to fail over and over and over again until you figure out how to get it right. But it's worth it. And as long as you align yourself with your values and the principles, and again, they'll talk about that just a little bit more in the book here, aligning with those gives you the courage and the foundation to move forward through all of those particular failures. Now, moving from courage and talking a little bit about vulnerability in particular. And um, one of the... I guess I'll go ahead and dive into it just a little bit and we'll, and we'll go from there. Vulner, the myth, she talks a little bit about some myths, myths about vulnerability. First myth is that vulnerability is weakness. And that is absolutely not the case. It actually takes far more strength to be vulnerable and to open yourself up to criticism, for instance, than to hide behind the armor, as she would call it here, and deflect that criticism, not listen to that criticism. Opening yourself up for that is a sign of strength, not of weakness. And I see this a lot. I get a lot of questions about um, you know, something making me feel like a weak leader. Almost all of the times where you come across and say, you know what, I think that makes me feel weak. I would say most of the time, it's actually the opposite. Doing that actually resonates strength to everybody else, not weakness. Again, people see through that authenticity or disingenuousness in people. And so if you're being authentic, you're going to come across stronger um, than other individuals might. Um, the other thing is talking about going it alone. All right. And now, 
when you, you open yourself to other individuals, oftentimes it's easier to go alone. And so opening yourself up to other team members, being a part of a team, is an aspect of vulnerability. And I really like this particular aspect that she highlights. To grow to adulthood is not to become autonomous and solitary. We think about that. We move to adulthood. We get out of our you know parents' house, go to college, get a job. We're becoming more independent. That isn't necessarily adulthood. It's to become the one on whom others can depend. So it isn't being independent and alone. It is actually being perhaps independent, but being relied upon by other individuals. That's something that makes moves us into adulthood. I just like that little takeaway. And there's a lot of these um, little, little, just like I say, little I want to say emotional nuggets that she, you, you pick up from her throughout. From I mean, she's got 20 years of research, so there's all kinds of these things that probably just flow off the top of her head that don't even um, aren't aren't even something that she's intentionally putting into the book. But there's a lot of great wisdom that you can pull from this. Um, one of those things, one of the other myths of vulnerability is that trust comes before vulnerability. All right. And I really consider that almost an excuse. All right. Because in, in, tr in truth, we know that it's the opposite. You don't get trust until you build up a relationship with other individuals. That relationship comes about by understanding one another. And the only way to get understanding is to be vulnerable enough to share yourself, what your values are, what your history is, what your weaknesses, your strengths are, sharing yourself with another individual. And that is a vulnerability. The thing that she highlights on here and the thing that I think is most important to you from a leadership perspective is that we too often believe that we're the only ones with some of these issues. I'm going to say that again. Too often as leaders, we believe that we are the only ones wrestling with some of these issues. We will have people, thousands of people from around the world who are leaders in different cultures, different continents, different industries that will be struggling with the same issues. All right. You are not alone in dealing with the issues that you deal with. In fact, there are probably millions, literally millions of people struggling with the exact same issues. All right. So if you feel like you're struggling in a particular area, it's not just you. It's everybody who has that same sort of struggle. But just a little takeaway. And we talk about that. She'll talk about that a little bit more um, later on in dealing with some of that. Um it turns out in moving on now from courage to vulnerability to talking about trust specifically, it turns out, and we've seen this with research, and she references research, but I've seen it in a bunch of different studies, that it turns out that trust is in fact earned in the smallest moments, all right, through paying attention, listening, and gestures of genuine care and connection. All right, if you want to build trust with your team members, all right, I always say start communicating more with them. What's going to happen is, is from that, you're going to be able to find those little moments. And I'm always a little skeptical of the research in regards to trust in this realm. I do think that, that those little things are the things that kind of stand out, but I think that there is kind of a barrier of entry, and that is getting the big things right. I think getting the big things right is taken as a given. So you, uh, they expect you to follow through on what they say. They expect you to be honest. But where the proof is, is in those little gestures. And like I say, I'm just a little bit sketchy on that, but not, not, not completely. Because oftentimes what happens is it, it's the little gestures that prove that you are genuine in the other things. That's where it comes through, those things that you could forget about. So again, looking at those, paying attention to people, listening, genuine act, gestures of genuine care and connection. That's what builds trust with a team. It's a lot of little things put together on a foundation of the big things. Now, the things to look out for, all right, when we talk trust, all right, the things to be aware of, uh, research calls them the four horsemen of the apocalypse, all right, <laughs> and that is, Criticism, that's something to watch out for that does not foster trust. Criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. I'm going to say those again. Those are what you need to watch for. If you think you have a trusting environment, but you see these things out there amongst your team, you don't have a trusting environment. Criticism, defensiveness, stonewalling, and contempt. Those are all things to look out for when looking to build trust. 
Trust is the stacking and layering of small amounts and reciprocal vulnerability over time. Trust and vulnerability grow together, and to betray one is to destroy both. Right, I'm going to say that one more time. Trust is the stacking and layering of small moments, small little things that you do, all right, and reciprocal vulnerability over time, making sure that they know that you care. Caring about somebody is an act of vulnerability, all right? Trust and vulnerability grow together, not one or the other. Both of them grow together, and to betray one is to destroy both. So if you want more trust in your environment, you are going to have to be willing to be vulnerable with your team. And to be vulnerable, you're going to have to have that courage. So tying all these things together just a little bit. Um, one thing, and I've hit on this before, but I want I wanted to, she references it here, um, talking about really high-performing teams. And, and Everybody knows that high-performing teams have a high level of trust, all right? But it's psychological safety. That's one of the big underpinnings, all right? Psychological safety. Team members feeling safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other was far and away the most important of the five dynamics that set successful teams apart. This was a Harvard Business School study that was done. Psychological safety, knowing that it's okay for me to be vulnerable, to raise my hand and give the dissenting opinion in a meeting. That is something that it, that it characterizes high-performing teams. And so if you don't have those moments, so first of all, if you're not demonstrating those moments of psychological safety, if you're not feeling it, there's an issue. If you don't have your team members stepping out and being vulnerable on a regular basis, that's going to be something that's indicative of a trust issue, which gets into a team issue, which gets into a performance issue. All right. But that psychological safety where people feel safe talking about things is hugely important. Banji, good to see you joined us today. Um, next little take takeaway is one of the ways to bring up that psychological safety. So we talked about, you know, okay, you want to pay attention and you want to listen and you want to show genuine care. Okay, but how do I do that, Cameron? That might be a great question, fair question to ask. One of those hacks to use for that is to, to use simply use two words. Say more, well, I'll also use say four words. Say more about that. Whatever it is that they brought up. All right. It might be that you don't know how to react. You almost want to get defensive about it. This is great in emotionally underpinned moments, all right, where you might be angry about the fact that they said whatever they did. You might be defensive about it. You might be frustrated by it. So the phrase that you want to use is say more about that. So instead of defaulting to emotion, what you're going to do is you're going to default to logic and getting more information. What this does is give you more information, but it also validates to that person that it was okay to say that. And that person sees it, and everybody that's in the room at the time sees it. And that's what helps foster that psychological safety that underpins trust, all right? Asking someone to say more often leads to profoundly deeper and more productive rumblings, as she calls it. She uses the, ter uses the term rumble, which could be conversation or meeting, all right? That gets into, a, a, as she says, another layer deeper and is a great hack for dealing with those emotional moments where your team gives you feedback that you don't necessarily want to hear. All right. Tell me more about that. Say more about this. This came up, I think, in Radical Candor as well, where they talked about um, the great connectors in big organizations, of, you know, those, those one people that seem to kind of connect with everybody out there. And that was one of the tools that they used was say more about that. Um, so that was a, that's a great tie-in. If you want to establish more connection, if you want to help dealing with those emotional moments, default to asking for more information. That'll help. And good to see you here. Um, Moving on from there and talking more about the discussion. So once you've established that trust, talking more about the discussions, there's a whole chapter that is labeled, and I really like this, clear is kind and unclear is unkind. So as far as your speech, what you're talking about is concerned. Clear is kind, unclear is unkind. Feeding people half-truths or bullshit, she doesn't have a problem swearing in this book, to make them feel better, which is almost always about making ourselves feel more comfortable, is unkind. I'm going to say that again. Feeding people half-truths and bullshit to make them feel better is unkind. And part of the reason that you feed them those half-truths is to make yourself more comfortable. Not to make them more comfortable. It is about you and making yourself more comfortable. I know I've been hugely guilty of that in the past. 
Talking about people rather than to them is also unkind. We call that gossip. But don't talk about people. Behind their backs to other people, in front of their backs, whatever else. Talk to them. That's going to be something that can help um, establish trust and get back to it. The other thing in regards, and this is kind of her second hack in regards to taking some of that feedback. All right, when you expose an uncomfortable topic, when you hit a nerve, you can ask them to, you know, say more about that, get more information. You may also find that you hit roadblocks, that everybody's emotions ramp up in a meeting, for instance. And what she recommends, and I've had success with this in the future, and I should have used it a whole lot more back in my career, was to circle back to people. It may be, you know what, we're kind of hitting a brick wall. Why doesn't everybody take 10 minutes, 15 minutes, an hour? a day to process this and we will come circle back to this and, and start fresh with it. Um, she said, she states in there, I've never regretted taking a short break or circling back after a few hours of thinking time. And I think that's, that's important when we, when we start opening ourselves up and being a little bit more vulnerable with the team and encouraging them to be vulnerable so that we can build that trust. We hit on those emotions and being able to successfully navigate the difficulties of those emotions is something that's very, very important um, to be able to speed along that process of really instilling some trust. Um, skip that one. Lots and lots of notes. You see, I fold over my pages here every time I've got something. So plenty of takeaways in this particular book. Um, great, great topic here. Great, great takeaway from this. Leaders must either invest a reasonable amount of time attending to fears and feelings or squander an unreasonable amount of time trying to manage ineffective and unproductive behaviors. This is that cost-benefit analysis. This is, it comes up all the time with listening. And I tell people, I don't have, you know, they say, I don't have time to listen. Well, you don't have time not to listen because if you don't listen, you're not going to get information. If you don't get information, you're going to make bad decisions. And if you make bad decisions, that's going to come pro cause problems down the road. And if that causes problems, that's going to take more time. All right, that's a huge issue. She talks about it here. If you aren't attending to the fears and feelings of your staff, you are going to be wasting time and you're going to just have to deal with the results of that, which will be not working to peak effectiveness and unproductive behaviors. So spending some time throughout your week, and I mean, it needs to be on a weekly basis, attending to the fears, feelings, concerns that your team has, making sure that you are addressing it, opening those up, bringing that out into the discussion is something that is going to pay off hugely as far as productivity is going to be concerned and is going to prevent a lot of problems from occurring down the line. It's one of those things where you don't have time not to attend to the feelings and concerns of your team. Um, now, if we keep going with this a little bit, um, which my answer program is, um, I'll get to that in a second, Israel. Um, if we're opening up those discussions with our team, all right, the thing is, is they are going to feel emotions, all right? They are allowed, she states in here, I like this, they're allowed to be pissed or sad or surprised or elated. But if their behaviors are not okay, then we have to set boundaries, all right? So you're allowed, if I'm telling you bad news, you're allowed to be sad. You're allowed to be pissed off, all right? But that can't reflect itself in your outward behaviors, rolling of eyes, raising of voices, physical posturing, that sort of thing. That's not okay. The feeling itself is fine. You also have to demonstrate that feeling in the right way. And she references, again, the timeout. If things get too heated, that's always a time to take a time out and, hey, let's get back to this in 10 or 15 minutes. Um, you know what, Isra, you know, I won't say what master program um, to get into. What I would say is avail yourself of resources that are out there. If you want to become a better leader, this is a great place to start, um, you know, taking a look at the books that are out there. Myself, a bunch of other individuals that talk through leadership, you can get through a lot of the difficulties in leadership and become a better leader just with some of those resources that are out there. Avail yourself of some of those and you'll see that you can just keep stacking those on. They keep coming after that. Um, next little comment and we start moving into um, still kind of talking through vulnerability a little bit. She goes and 
it's on page 76 and 77 in here, and you won't be able to read this, but there's two, two charts in here. One is armored leadership, that is the defensive posturing leadership, and it's contrasted with the daring leadership that is in there. All right, so um, I, I guess I, I'm looking for a, a good example of the, the dichotomy here. So armored leadership might be being a knower and being right. Daring leadership is being a learner and getting it right. And, and I, love, I, love, I love that term, getting it right. And I come back to, um, and again, I think it was in, in the book Radical Candor was relaying a story about Steve Jobs or one of Steve Jobs' mentors. And he was always, or he, he was bemoaning the fact that Steve Jobs always gets it effing right. All right. And what he meant by that was that Steve Jobs was not always right. Steve Jobs always got it right. And, and he goes into a discussion on that, that what actually pissed off um, Steve Jobs, more than anything, was when you didn't stand up to him and, and explain to him why the course of action was wrong. He wanted to get it right. He didn't care whether he was right or wrong. He wanted to get it right. And he put people on task. When things went wrong, he'd get pissed off at them for not hitting their points harder so that they could have made the right decision back before. So I like that as opposed to being right, getting it right. Getting it right means that other people are going to take you off of, dissuade you from your course of action um, oftentimes. And you do that in the humbleness of, of the overall mission of the organization. Um, another, talking about um, modeling um, kindness and hope in this, working through some of these dichotomies she's talking about. And it just kind of jumped out at me because I know that we all deal with this in our, our day in, day out work. And that is, if what's under cynicism and sarcasm is despair, the antidote is cultivating hope. I've been in many organizations where there is a lot of cynicism and there is a lot of sarcasm. And truthfully, I think most of the time underpinning that is despair. And that is nothing's going to get better. It always goes the same way. I'm not happy. I'm not going to get any happier, et cetera, et cetera. It's despair. And so the way to tackle that, the antidote for that is to start cultivating hope and putting your focus on that. Now that may mean organizational changes, but that's actually how you, you, you tackle cynicism and sarcasm is with hope, not necessarily tackling them directly. And that's a takeaway that I have because people have asked me about that in the past. Um, and that's not a point that I've hit on on it at all. Um, talking about our own self-worth. All right, working through again, some of these dichotomies. When we do not understand our value, we often exaggerate our importance in ways that are not helpful. And we consciously or unconsciously seek attention and validation of importance. We put more value on being right than on getting it right. It creates franticness instead of calm cooperation. So I know I've always dealt with this in organizations is a, is a you know, a fear of my own self-worth and how much, you know, I was bringing to the table on things. And so what happens is when you have that, you often exaggerate your contribution and you create a little bit more freneticness in the, in the, in the operation. But it was just a little like personal takeaway that I wanted um, to bring up to everybody out there. Uh, because I know that lots of us are in political environments where everybody around you is posturing, for instance. And so you almost feel a need to do that, but it's counterproductive because of the effect that it has on everybody else in the organizations. Um, getting back to the psychological safety of the team members, daring leaders work to make sure people can be themselves and feel a sense of belonging. Part of that psychological safety is the ability to open up and be yourself. This is about having a diverse workforce, not about having a bunch of robots. And so you want to know what people's hobbies are, what their differences are. Yes, you'll come across all kinds of similarities, but having that differences and being people being able to bring their true selves to work is hugely important in accomplishing the shared mission that everybody has. Who they are and the mission you're all working for don't need to be perfectly aligned with everybody in the organizations. Allow your team the flexibility to be themselves and express themselves. 
the one of the just dumbest ways that this happened in my career was dress up days. It was one of those just silly things to kind of break up the monotony. Every other Friday, it would be, you know, everybody wear red to work. So, you know, I'd wear a red tie or something like that. You know, everybody wear green, everybody wear polka dots, everybody wear stripes, you know, that sort of thing. Again, silly, stupid. You wouldn't think it would accomplish anything. You would have been shocked at what that did for the team. People would come in with old 50s poodle skirts for polka dot day. People would dress up. People were allowing themselves to express themselves. And when a few people did it, then a few more people did it. And we ended up learning way more about each other through, again, a simple exercise like that. But allowing and finding ways for people to bring their true and authentic selves to work is hugely important in getting the most out of them from a productivity standpoint. All right. Um, one of the other things is is talking straight and taking action. Um, talking, you know, through authenticity in regards to, she makes the statement, we love the truth because it's increasingly rare. In a lot of the questions that I will get in my Mentor Minute sessions, I'll tell people to just be honest. You will see me use the word transparency. If you, if you look through transcripts, uh, you, you see me use the term transparency a ton. Why? Because people appreciate it so much in this day and age. Just getting a straight answer from your boss about what's going on is refreshing. Yes, the news that you might have gotten was depressing, but it was great that you actually got it and you end up getting more respect from your team members and that fear that you had that they'd freak out about whatever it is that you were talking about is kind of minimized by the fact that you actually gave them truth and real information. I like to say that people are used to being able to Google the answer to any single question they could possibly have. And so when you give them that information, it makes them feel more secure. Even if the information itself didn't necessarily foster security, they will feel that security just by being able to have access to that information and that truth. Um, the kind of rounding out this discussion through these dichotomies, we talked about attending to the fears and the feelings of your team members and how you have to invest that time up front to save yourself a ton of time down the road. Angelica, glad you were able to join us. Another comment that's, that's made here, and it's under the section leading from the heart, um, is that we also have to invest time attending to our own fears, feelings, and history, or we'll find ourselves managing our own unproductive behaviors. You have to set aside that time to recognize what you're feeling in the moment. If you know, if if you're having a down day, why are you ask yourself the question, why am I feeling? What has contributed to this? If you're angry, what's contributed to that? Find ways to get in touch with your feelings, your fears, your concerns, because what that's going to do is that's going to help you be more productive. So if you don't spend that time, you're going to manage all that unproductiveness down the road. Whereas if you spend that time, you'll gain that productivity down the road. That's a classic great investment of time to get a return. And oftentimes it can be in the near term. Asking that question when you're having a down day can be the thing that turns you out of that down mood. So instead of going through the rest of your day, blah, you bring a little bit more energy and get a little bit more um, out of the day itself. Um, Talking through shame, and, and I think this was part of why the book didn't resonate with me so much. Again, lots of great points. You see me getting kind of, you know, fired up about some of these points. The book itself was kind of blah for me. And a lot of it was Brene um, going back to, I want to say, her main subjects. And hey, she spent 20 years talking about shame, for instance. So we get a definition of shame here, which is getting awfully deep down the well of emotions from a leadership standpoint. But there are some great takeaways from it. With all of that said, um, and my hesitations on, on opening up that topic, um, there, there's great points to take away from this and great applications for you as a leader. Shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love, belonging, or connections. All right? Shame drives two tapes, as she says it, and this is where it really applies because I know I felt these same things, and that is the first tape that plays is you are never good enough, all right? Part of that reason that I had that self-consciousness back in my career and I might do some posturing is I never felt that I was good enough, all right? I knew there was more that I could be giving, that sort of thing. That produces shame, or that's how it comes out. The second thing that comes out is who do you think you are? 
What makes you the expert in these things? So those are the two things that play out. You're never good enough. And who do you think you are? Those are indicators of shame in the workplace. I might pick just a different word for it. Maybe that's where I have the issue with that, um, this particular topic. Um, but those are those things. And, and hitting that second part of who do you think you are? Almost every expert that is out there, and I don't necessarily classify myself as an expert, but getting up and standing in front of you know several hundred people and giving a speech on a particular topic, I ask myself, who do you think you are? I do that. You might do that in a meeting. Well, who am I to counteract the idea of the CFO or the CEO or to question those sorts of things? Who am I? So that's the record that plays in your head through that. And it's kind of indicative of shame. And if you can get past it, you can get to more of your authentic self and get to be um, contributing more and being more of a daring leader to tie into the uh, title of the book. Um, I, I, the, kind of talking up through um, the firing of an individual. Uh, the one thing that you want to do with this is she highlights on here is give people a way out with dignity. All right. You're not there to berate them or anything else. And a few things, when you're delivering the news, be kind, be clear, be respectful, and be generous. All right, those are four things. Be clear, be kind, be respectful, and be generous. So if you can just manage to do that, it makes it a little bit easier. I tell people, usually when I'm, I'm firing individuals, it doesn't take in long at all. 10 minutes max, because they should already know. We already had discussions about what was going on. So they should know that it's coming. And if, if they don't, then you have a whole other issue. But they should know it's coming. So you mentioned the issue. You have the paperwork all ready to go. You tell them what's going to happen, what the next steps are, HR, unemployment, that sort of thing. You give them an idea what the next steps are. You respectfully move them out to go pick up their stuff, escort them out of the building, and bam, it's just like that. It's relatively quick, but that's actually a, a, an aspect of kindness, um, I would say, with it as well. But just a little bit of a takeaway there is giving them a means of going out with dignity. Um, and that's important to, as far as, you know, not creating a scene um, and doing it the right way. Um, talking and moving now through empathy. And so empathy gets talked about a lot. Big aspect of emotional intelligence. I often just kind of equate the two, two together. Empathy, first part of the skill of empathy is to see the world as others see it, or as they call it, perspective taking. Um, so you want to try to see the world through your employees' eyes or through your peers' eyes. That's empathy. Now, that's often difficult, and you might get a hint of it. And when you get that hint of it, what you do is you engage the other person. You say, tell me more. What are you thinking about this? And so you open up the discussion and get more of that information from them. So you can recognize something that's going on. And even if you don't understand it completely, you have a way of getting more information. Um, the second aspect of it is being non-judgmental, not having any judgment associated with that, certainly not having it at the start. You want to be getting information there. And there was a great comment in regards to being judgmental. And, you know, it's, it's a very common human trait, again, one that, you know, I certainly deal with all the time. But it was it, there was an interesting takeaway that kind of clarified some things for me. And that is the good news is that we don't judge in areas where we feel a strong sense of self-worth and grounded confidence. So that the more of that that we build, the more we let go of judgment. Judgment's a very difficult thing to get past. All right. Even, you know, we, we see it in even just petty matters. All right. But when it's in relation to an area where we have a strong sense of self-worth and confidence in that particular area, we don't exercise that judgment. Judgment is almost a, um, um, an identification of some of the weaknesses that you have. And, and that was a discussion point that somehow I did not um, underline in here, that we are most often judgmental in areas that we are self-conscious about. And so that can be an indication of an area that you need to work on. If you are judgmental on other individuals in regards to something, you can likely find that that is an area that you could be improving upon. Um, when we talk empathy, and, and again, whole books written on empathy, on emotional intelligence, on dealing with the human beings at work, not the, not, not the employee numbers at work. Um, there's a lot that goes into it, and this was great. Liz, good to see you here. 
Um, I agree to practice empathy. Screw it up, circle back, clean it up, and then try again. Going back to this persistence aspect of things, you are going to mess these things up. All right, when you try to be empath empathic, sounds like you um, trying to read people's minds, but when you're trying to exercise empathy towards individuals, especially if you haven't done it before, you're going to make some mistakes. You're going to read things wrong. You're going to react to them in the wrong way. You're going to help them deal with it in the wrong way. Um, and so it's important that you realize that you are going to make those mistakes and that those are okay. Making mistakes is fine. I deal. I dealt with a... Um, a business owner over in Ireland, and we were talking through um, a new division that he was looking to create, and he wanted to take somebody from customer service, and instead of having them work on it half a day, having them work on it for two days, but he just didn't know whether that was something that was going to be um, was going to cause problems. And my advice was, is you're the owner, it's not a huge company, try it for two weeks. Bring the customer service manager in and say, hey, I'm going to take this person out from half a day to two days um, and see what happens and have an open discussion about it with the employee, with the customer service manager and with yourself. And you can always go back. All right. You can always fix that mistake. And that's too many times we try to, to tiptoe around particular issues with with employees. And what happens is when we're tiptoeing around things, when we're trying to massage the message, we come across as disingenuous which defeats the entire purpose of having that discussion. I'd rather be transparent, try it out, and especially in areas where it's easy to fix the mistake or to take things back to the way that they were in the case that I was using before. Um, so realize that with empathy, with vulnerability, with building trust with team members, you are going to make mistakes. But the more open you are with those mistakes, the easier it is to recover from them, learn from them, and actually turn them into something that improves your progression, not something that inhibits the progression. Um, hit on this, she hits on this again, not very hard, but just one of these almost just like offhand comments that's made, but it reinforced what was big in the dichotomy of leadership, which I reviewed recently, um, which was that easy learning doesn't build strong skills. And that was a big takeaway for me because I've created training programs in a corporate environment before, and they're pretty meh, easy. You work people really step through by step through there. We don't make it difficult with role play scenarios and that sort of thing. Making training difficult is something that's going to build more growth with your team and is going to make more of that training come out. So that would be a big, just a, again, an offhand takeaway in the book, but a reinforcement and something that's being talked about now. A couple of uh, best-selling leadership books in the last month have been talking about making training more difficult for your staff um, to get more growth out of it. Um, talking through you know, so much of this, one of those things that can help in all of these things, whether it is empathy, whether it is vulnerability, whether it is building trust, is fostering courage, or courage, fostering curiosity. And curiosity is an act of vulnerability and courage. All right. To be curious, you have to admit that you don't know something. That's an act of vulnerability. To ask about it is an act of courage. And so curiosity and exercising that curiosity is a great way of exercising your vulnerability and your courage. So if you want to work on those two aspects, try to get more curious and you'll naturally start giving yourself um, some uh, exercise on those, those courage and vulnerability muscles. Um, now he's, she's talking a little bit and talking about when we're talking and tying it into, you know, being a daring leader. All right. And again, from her perspective, that daringness is often tied to emotions. Um, and so she's now bringing in values. So we've talked through trust building, being vulnerable ourselves, um, all of those things. Now we're moving into lining things with our values. All right. Step one, we can't live into our values that we can't name. The first step in living into our values is divining what's most important to us. All right. My professional values or my personal values is often a question that she gets. And here's the rub. We only have one set of values. And so flipping the page here, start looking at that list of values there. She's got a ton. And so the, the challenge, I don't know, she must have 100 here. The challenge is to identify just two. 
So this is an exercise I kind of hit on as I was reading, but it was taking a long time and it's difficult. It is tough to get to our true values in that sense. And so I've been able to isolate it down to a few and I still need to go back and kind of winnow that down. But getting into Stephen Covey's The the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, we move strongest with those things that align with our values and who we are and what we find important. And so you need to have that grounding and it gives you direction on what it is that you need to be doing in particular situations. It's kind of almost creates a rule book or a test for everything that you do is, well, does it align with my values? Um, And so we have values. All right. Now, it quickly jumps, you know, this was a personal exercise, but we also have companies that have values, that have core principles, that have a mission statement, and we all know them. Now, the the, the tragic aspect of this is in her research, she's found that only 10% of the companies um, that uh, 10% of the organizationals, organizations have operationalized their values. So they have values, but nobody has any idea how to apply those values. And I do this actually in my, my workplace culture workshops where we'll take the values of the organization and apply them to the most common, basic, and frequent things that the organization does. Each department, how does this tie into these values? And so it's important to operationalize your values. So once you've defined your two values, they're your two core values in your personal and professional life, remember they're the same, then you apply three or four behaviors that align with those. And I might take that a step further and say, well, what do you do most commonly and how does that align with those values, all right? So define three or four behaviors that support our values and three or four, she doubles back to this, slippery behaviors, actions that we find ourselves tempted to do even though they are counter to our values. So three or four things, to that behaviors that align with our values and then three or four things that we are tempted to do that don't align with our values. If we hit on both of those aspects, then we've now operationalized those two things and it's easier to equate those in the real world. Um, so now she doubles back to feedback all right going going back into feedback so we've gotten to our values and now let's get back into feedback and i actually like the fact that she doubles back to it because getting the feedback of your employees is something that i'm hugely passionate about and is the thing that will get you the biggest improvement in your own leadership and in the productivity of your team, the more feedback and engagement that you have with your team. And so she talks through some of the um, ways in which you would be ready to give or receive feedback. All right. These are the things that you would look for if you want to be ready to, to give or receive feedback. I know I'm ready to give feedback when I'm ready to sit next to you rather than across from you. I know I'm ready to give feedback when I'm willing to put the problem in front of us rather than between us or sliding it towards you. I love her little asides in this. I know I'm ready to give feedback when I'm ready to listen, ask questions, and accept that I may not fully understand the issue, so important with our bosses. I know I'm ready to give feedback when I'm ready to acknowledge what you do well instead of just picking apart your mistakes. I know I'm ready to give feedback when I'm open to owning my part of the issue. And I like that last one in particular. So much of it is us deflecting our own ownership and our own applica- and our own issues with the uh, with the problem. And I see this with ownership with leaders. And you know, it's one of those things where when we talk, say, extreme ownership, where it, when something goes wrong, it's my fault as the leader. And what I always come back to is, yes, I get it. You know what? Cameron screwed up over there, and he shouldn't have done that. But ultimately, Cameron is under your direction. Could you have given him more tools to do the job better, more training to make sure it was ingrained in how he did his business? Could you have followed up with him a little bit more? Could you have been looking over his shoulder a little bit more? There's almost always something that you could have done to prevent that from occurring. And being able to give feedback well to other individuals is acknowledging that there's always some sort of role that you play in that as well. All right. It doesn't mean that you are getting them a get out of jail free card. All right. It means that you share in the ownership of that particular issue. That's strong leadership when you can accomplish that. 
Um, now, when you are receiving feedback, there were three simple things. I really like these. Three simple things. When you are receiving feedback, I want you to play these three in your head. And you should list these down. I say to myself, I'm brave enough to listen. Right? First and foremost, when you're receiving criticism, are you brave enough to listen or are you tuning out? Too many of us tune out. Two, there's something valuable here. This is my advice for crummy meetings that are pointless. There's something of value here. So you're getting that feedback, all right? There's something of value. Three, this is the path to mastery. I love, I love that, finishing it off there. This is the path to mastery. So three things, when you're receiving criticism or you're receiving feedback, I'm brave enough to listen, there's something valuable here, and this is the path to mastery, all right? Getting even just one little nugget is a part of it. We don't get stronger, better from a sports perspective without failures or without coaching. Uh, that, that has to take pace or instructors. And those are almost always pointing out the things that we are doing wrong. Picking up those things that you're doing wrong in your leadership is the path to getting better. That's how you get better. Being able to fully acknowledge and hold the discomfort gives us power in both giving and receiving feedback. Giving feedback isn't always something that's comfortable. Receiving feedback is certainly not comfortable in many instances, but it is. But being able to deal with that discomfort, hold on to it, will help us be better in both of those particular areas um, and Im improve those around us and ourselves. Um, talking now about the feedback that you get, and part of part of um, you know listening and trying to get something from it is an acknowledgement, and we've seen this, is assume positive intent. So when people are, when people do things that irritate you, frustrate you, piss you off, that are mistakes, assume positive intent. The, the other way that I've heard this, is, another great kind of get out of jail for, for people that offend you is um, don't prescribe to uh, malice what could be prescribed to in ignorance. All right, so those sorts of things. So, um, Assume positive intent. An assumption of positive intent relies on the core belief that people are doing the best they can with what they've got. And so they might not have the whole story. They might not have all of the information that you have, and that's why they are giving you the feedback that they are. They might not have, this is the tough one, they might not have the interpersonal skills to relay that in the way that you are going to hear best. All right, but if you assume a positive intent with everybody, then it's going to be much easier for you to accept their feedback and then roll with it. There's always a kernel of truth there, regardless of how it comes across. So I like to, just that she hits on that particular aspect of things. John, glad you were able to join us here um, for the last five or ten minutes, I think, is, is what we probably have left here. Um, Getting back in and kind of, again, circling back to some of these things. So talking through trust and why it is important, and I, I hope I don't have to hit on this point, but survey after survey, study after study, trust between managers and employees is the primary defining characteristic of the very best workplaces. Trust, I'll, I'll use the simple example for those that are still sketchy on trust. If your team trusts you and your decisions they will buy into what you are telling them to do quicker and they will do it faster and get to work on it faster without all of the mistrust or questioning that might go through their head. That's the practical application of trust. It goes way deeper than that, but that's just the obvious one that's out there. If they trust you, they're gonna do what you say more often and quicker without hesitation. So trust is a huge aspect. And, and like I said, you're not going to find a study out there that's going to say that trust is bad for the performance of an organization. Um, so given that simple fact, kind of highlights the importance of driving, diving into some of these details. Um, integrity, and it's just, just talking through, again, trust with her. Integrity is choosing courage over comfort. It's choosing what's right over what's fun, fast, or easy. And it's practicing your values, not just professing them. So all of these things that we've been talking about in this book tie to the concept of integrity, which is doing what you should be doing, what you're supposed to be doing, what you believe in doing. And when you do that and you're honest and open about it, then people understand you more. And it creates this virtuous loop where you start getting feedback 
that reinforces your values and your integrity, people see more of you, which again feeds it around again. And so working on that aspect of things all feeds into integrity, which again is one of those classic ones that we know um, is, is good for our leadership. Um, what do, talking about team members, what do your team members do that earns your trust? So going through some, some surveys that she did, again, she's a researcher, so she went out, and what do team members do that earn your trust? The most common answer was asking for help. You know that you can trust your team, and you know that you've built an environment of trust when it's okay for people to ask each other for help or to ask you for help. All right. And the, the, the application that is discussed in here is I can trust somebody to do something when I know that they will come to me if they have any questions. But I can't trust people who I don't know whether they're going to come to me if they hit any blockers. All right. That's what fosters that trust. Asking for help is a power move. And I, I recommend doing the same thing with your team. What are the things that you don't know? What are the things that you need to understand? go to the team and ask for help in understanding. There's a way to reverse this as well and build trust from both sides of the equation. One of, that's one of, the, one of the most powerful things you can do as a leader is to say that I don't know. The other thing is I made a mistake and this is what I learned from it. All right, I don't know and I made a mistake. Those are vulnerable things. And those are things that aren't done nearly enough in the, in the workplace today. But it's exactly the sort of thing that's going to create an environment of trust, which is going to get you those crazy results that, sh that show up in every single survey that's done of great places to work and most productive teams. Um, finishing it off here, um, and, and I, I, I've never seen this discussion taking place, taking place in a book before, but I think it's important um, that it does here. And that is the same is true in leadership. She's talking about skydiving and how you practice jumping out of the airplane on the ground a whole bunch of times before you go up there. We can't expect people to be brave and risk failure if they're not prepping for hard landings. You have to prep yourself for the hard landings. When you step out and want to be vulnerable and want to be more open with the team, as we've said, you're going to make mistakes. Realize that those mistakes are not final and that you can learn from them, but you can also prepare yourself for what you might do in cases where it goes horribly wrong. You can do some contingency planning on discussions, just like you can do contingency planning on projects and that sort of thing. All right. When we have the courage to walk into our story and own it, when we have the, to walk into the reality of our situation, what our values say, what our situation at work says, what our relationship with our coworkers, what our past history is, what our experience. When we have the courage to walk into our story and own it, we get to write the ending. And when we don't own our stories or fail of failures, setbacks, and hurt, they own us. So if you don't step into all of those things, then you are not in control of those things. Uh, you know, it's a cute way of saying it. You get to write the ending of that particular story if you own it. But if you don't own all of your failings, all of your feelings, all of those things, if you don't own those, then you have no control over writing it and figuring out how it finishes off and comes to fruition. Um, again, one of those other little casual takeaways that she just writes down and that, that I found interesting, and that is we talked about how courage is contagious. But everything that a leader does is contagious. And she actually throws, throws out there four simple words. Calm is equally contagious. And that's something you see when you're going through a crisis, when you're going through difficult times, when profits are down, when sales are down. People look to the leader to see how to react. And so, yes, courage is contagious in day in, day out work. But calm is also contagious. If you present calm in a crisis, the people around you are going to be at least more calm than they would before. And that's simple for everybody to see if you, you know, if you've ever, uh, you know, had a child, uh, you know, three, four, five year old child and they trip and fall down on the sidewalk. It's the parent that runs over and goes, oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Are you OK? Are you OK? And the kid cries and wails. And then the other parent, you know, kid falls and they walk over and go, hey, you all right there, buddy? You know, that, then the kid gets up and goes, yeah, I'm OK. You know, so peop, your, your employees look to you for that reaction, just like a child looks to their parents for that reaction. 
Calm is contagious. Courageousness is contagious. Innovation is contagious. Um, malice is contagious. You get what you give um, as a leader. Um, one of those things about stories, though, and, and finishing off with a couple of final points here, um, one of those things that can really trip us up when we are looking to kind of step into that vulnerability and step into the emotional aspect of leading things. And that is, in the absence of data, we will always make up stories. So in the absence of all of the facts in regards to a situation, we will always, it's wired into our brains, it's neuroscience, we will always take our best guess in filling in the blanks. All right, and that's why it's so important to engage with the team and ask them questions about, tell me more about that or whatever else, because you don't want to be guessing. Even if you have a really good idea of what's going on and how to fill in those blanks, there's going to be that subset of time where you're wrong and that's going to hurt. And so it doesn't need to hurt nearly as bad. All right. One of the, the way to tackle that is when you see these things. So the, she uses the example in here of a meeting and somebody is super quiet in a meeting. And so she takes it to be that the person is pissed off because her team is doing all of the work and isn't getting any of the credit. They're doing the work for other departments in this. And so she, you know, person's quiet, person must be pissed. All right. The way out of this is, you know, hey, I noticed that you were quiet in the meeting. Yeah, I was a little quiet in the meeting, you know, and. So it can be, they use the example, it could be that she was just tired. She was up late all night. Her kid was throwing up, that sort of thing. So she was just tired. That was why she was quiet. The other thing is, the other route that goes is, yeah, you're darn right. I was quiet. I'm pissed off that my team's busting their butt for everybody else and not getting any of the credit. All right. So you got two different reactions. One is, okay, there was no issue. Great. Love it. The other thing is, okay, the issue is exactly what I thought it was. All right. So what do you do about that? And I, the great little takeaway is that, okay. Let's sit down and talk about it. We're going to make this issue go away, deal with it, bring some more clarity from both our sides to it, whatever it is. All right. So on the one side, you get the win of it's not an issue. The second thing is you get the win of getting more clarification, and hopefully diffusing that issue. All right. Phrase she used again. I'll, I'll use it. OK, let's sit down and talk about it. All right. You're damn right. I'm pissed because of this. OK, let's go sit down and talk about it. All right opening up those dialogues and those discussions. And when you can do that on a regular basis, you've got a fully functioning team that can produce all of the results that they are capable of without those emotional barriers. You lead human beings. You don't lead robots. Human beings are complicated, all right? But the benefit of that is, is that they can actually produce outstanding and outsized results if you can get them um, working all in the right direction and address all of those emotional concerns. So summing up, Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Good book. I, I, I opened it up and, and I um, opened up this discussion by saying that I didn't particularly care for this book. I didn't dislike it, didn't like it, um, but that was kind of reading through it. And when I went through and took a look at my notes, um, all of the things that I underlined, there was a ton of really good stuff in here. And so a couple of takeaways from that. A, I recommend that when you're reading business books to underline them. It's a great way to review. You can review a whole book in 15 or 20 minutes by just looking at your underlines. It's also a way to isolate some of the great learning. So even a book that doesn't necessarily resonate with you, I would have walked away from this book saying, meh. But actually, there's a lot of really good takeaways on this. The other thing is if you get in the practice of reading, this is the book, a book that I have put down to come back to in another three, four, six, eight, nine months. All right, I want to look at this book again. It may be that this week just wasn't a good week for me to listen or read about vulnerability and all these super touchy-feely sort of things. Don't usually have a problem with it. I'm a big fan of this stuff. It needs to be brought out more in leadership, but for whatever reason, it didn't resonate with me, but it can resonate with me down the road. And so that's something that I want to get to. Getting in the practice of reading gives you that flexibility of coming back to a book like this. So with that being said, next week, Friday, noon Pacific Standard Time, Angela Duckworth's Grit. I will be checking that out. I'm excited to dive into that one, so I hope you'll tune in then. Otherwise, everybody have a great weekend, and I will see you on the other side of the weekend. Thanks so much, everybody. Bye-bye.